uh, Tim was using my huge bass amp and we put it in the back and it wasn't fully all the way in and Tim slammed the door and just completely shattered my back window. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the dead of winter. Oh, was, you, were... you know, it was like midnight. We had to like park my car in the back of the apartment building because it just <laughs> had no window in it. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to In the Writer's Room here, Ronnie Chris, and I'm here with my great friend, Mr. Andy Madden, frontman of the Chicago-based rock band Toy Robots. Hey Andy, what's going on? What's up, buddy? It's great to see you, man. <laughs> Me and Andy have known each other a really long time, <laughs> so this is a, we're doing this video here for you all, but this is also a, a meeting of great friends, so I'm excited to talk to you, Andy, and we're excited that, you know, Andy and I have recorded together for many years um but this is it's exciting that on the new record that i have out highways uh the track leaving things is a track that andy and i wrote and andy plays he's one of the guitar players on that track and so today we want to talk about leaving things and talk about the writing process because that's what in the writer's room is all about is just you know talking about how we write the songs and and where the ideas come from what it was like where we were, that kind of fun stuff, and then how it's progressed into this the actual record. So um, this one goes way back, doesn't it, buddy? <laughs> it really does. It's like a foggy distant <laughs> memory, you know, that I'm trying to think about. Yeah, it's it's hard to remember exactly uh, the start of it. Um, I if I remember correctly, it was you know, and I'm getting old, and my memory doesn't work the way it used to. Um, at least my wife says is that it was a guitar lick that you had come up with, and you had showed me at some point. I don't know if we were practicing or we were hanging out at the apartment because also Andy and I lived together for quite a few years in the early days in Chicago, so we were around each other a lot. And I don't know, you can tell me if you remember it differently, but I think it was a guitar lick that you had and you had shown me and I like lit up and I thought it was amazing. That's uh, that's pretty much what I remember too. You know, it was like we were living on Diversity Street in, in the Tomek Castle. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we had that we had that room that we had converted into a studio and, and uh, yep. I can remember the Epiphone Scroll 250 that I had with a kind of curly top. Yep, and uh, you know, I think I was just messing around, kind of playing like a bluesy lick or you know, riff, and it was just like an afterthought. But you just like lit up, you're like, What is that? you know, so uh, from there, it just kind of um, spiraled out from there. You know, it was just like, All mm -hmm. right, if that's kind of that main lick, and then um, you know, we, we built kind of those climbing sections around it, and, yeah, you know, so I, th I think. I think from what I remember in those early days, you know, for me, it was just a lot of kind of like, you know, uh, walking in the dark, you know, trying to find your way through like mm. what sounds good, you know. Um, so it was always helpful to get that like immediate feedback from from you or from like Tim or anybody else or Brian, you know. Like, yeah. All so. our musical friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was it, it definitely was that. I mean, like writing in general. In those days, we were so early and green in terms of like what that's like, which is it, there's a there's a really cool innocence about that because you kind of stumble on things and you don't know if they're not the right thing to do. You just like the way they feel, yeah. which sometimes is better than if it's, you know, if there's technically a better way to do said thing, you know, but, um, you know, we would come up with like guitar parts and, you know, for me, a lot of times I know it would just you know, just discovering the guitar, you know, when you're, when you're, you're, you're young and you're, you're learning how to play guitar, you were ahead of me, obviously, because you were a better guitar player at the time we met, but still, as you kind of run across something new, it, it makes you think, oh, well, what can I do with this? Like the natural tendency to be one, to be a creator makes you think, okay, well, this is cool. And this makes me feel like something. And, and then, you know, for me, as soon as I hear something that's interesting, like that lick that you had, it made me want to sort of think about, well, what kind of song can that be, you yeah. know? And so we started, like you said, putting those chords together, um, you know, and I think I remember when I first started coming up with lyrics for it, it was kind of like, the funny thing is the song is not a whole, the new, the, the version we have now is definitely more, developed in terms of the lyrical content but yeah the spirit i think is pretty similar 
you know, and I think that's why it still made sense that it would work for this record when I came back to it later, which we'll talk about. Um, because I think the original spirit was about, you know, kind of moving past things that are uh, difficult uh, a little bit and not, you know, not being, not carrying too much of a weight, right? And, and, and so that's where the idea of the leaving things, like leaving things behind, leaving things behind that you don't need, things that drag you down. I think those were always the ideas I had. I, I don't even really remember the original lyrics too much. I mean, I, I know there's a recording that I tried to find before this video and I couldn't find it that of us doing it live at, on Common Ground. <laughs> <laughs> and I also think in that recording, I think the reason I can't find it is because I didn't lock that recording down because I think I was, uh, I think I had forgotten the lyrics at that show. And so I was mumbling like nonsense lyrics. So, <laughs> which you know all about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I don't have any concrete. I probably have a document somewhere that has the old lyrics. Um, but I know the, I know there was a lyric in there. Don't take more than you need. That's one I always remember. And, and yeah. I think, I think the general sense was that was like what the original idea of the song was about. But I mean, it was, we liked it enough that we ended up like, again, like I said, we played it at a show. So we yeah. kind of felt like we had a finished version at that time. <clears throat> yeah. I think we played it out um, at a lot of shows. You know, I remember playing like the wise fools pub or something and playing it there. Yeah. Um, you know, it kind of, I think what's great about the song is it, it, it evokes that emotion. It has that kind of driving rhythm kind of feels like the open road, you know, it kind of calls back to Chuck Berry or, springsteen you know it just kind of it's mm -hmm. a bed a, for it's a you know, all that to visual it. yeah so i was always really impressed with how you were able to kind of um uh, cut into that and kind of pull out the emotion and put words to it you know i think um i think that's what i've always been impressed with you know by your your mm -hmm. songwriting you know so, oh. <laughs> well you know we, we uh yeah we definitely that was the cool thing about our particular team like you know, obviously me and you and then the people, our good friends that we had together that sort of filled out everything, the different people that have been involved over the years, uh, which we should do a special video about that someday for sure. But <laughs> um, was, you know, it's just sort of with me and you in particular, it was always like there was the sound, there was the sort of the musical part that I just connected with. So then it was easy for me to take to work with you on certain things and then and then try to put these ideas that I had in my head of, of what, what I thought those songs emoted what they felt like you know another one that we did that's not on this record but is one of our kind of classic ones is hesitation and it's like you know it was like a little guitar thing I showed you which I showed you a very simple thing and then you were able to take the simple thing and give it more legs but then we turned it into a, <clears throat> a pretty emotional, like heartfelt song that like, you know, you still I can still listen to today and I can feel that song, you know. Yeah. And of course, we you know, I feel like we, you know, for especially for the age we were in the time and our resources, I felt like we knocked that recording out of the park for sure. Yeah. You know? um, so, yeah, this has always been a, it's been a good relationship that 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 writing process. So it was exciting for me when I just when I was putting this record together and again, it, like you said, the record that I'm putting together, Highways, is that that's the thread of the record, this this ongoing <clears throat> struggle to find yourself and to, to, to feel like you need to get to where you belong. And the road and the highway is the thread that's in all the songs, right? And so part of the reason why I thought when I'm thinking about songs that should go on this record, I had two thoughts. I was like, I really feel like the musical sound of leaving things the original leaving things should be on this record like it feels like it belonged and i felt like the record needed a real rock and kind of move in tune but i knew the lyrics at that moment weren't right for the record so it put me at a place it's like okay should i should i try again you know because i've tried the funny thing about that song is i've always loved that song and i've always felt like the original lyrics were me still young and learning how to write and so that i didn't think they were quite what they needed to be and I always kept trying to rewrite them. And I was always wanting to sort of rewrite them and show them to you once I had it done. And honestly, Andy, like it, I, I failed every time, like I, for, for 10 years, like I did it, I would periodically try and then I'd give up and <clears throat> come back a few months later or two years later. And I try again and I would fail. And I was like, why can't I write lyrics to this song? <laughs> like what's going on? I'm, I've all the while I've written like, hundreds of songs in between and it's like why can't i write <laughs> lyrics to this song and the weird thing about it was is it took the it took the urgency of the album and the connective tissue of the other songs i guess to give me the juice that i needed to finish it it was like i i, I guess i was able to i was writing to something a little bit more 
than just trying sure. to write out of nowhere. Yeah. And so that, that's what that's where a lot of these new lyrics come from, which I remember when I showed it to you and, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about that and like your experience of hearing the new lyrics once we finally I sent that to you the first time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, we, like you said, we've been talking about this for a while, you know, and every so often we, you know, we uh, catch up and we bring up, oh, we got to write something or we should work on something. And then you're like, oh, you, you know, leaving things, leaving things. And, you know, like I said before, it was always kind of like this faint memory of like, I remember the musical content of it and, and parts of it, but, you know, it was kind of hazy as to like what the message of the song was. Um, so, you know, when I finally, uh, when I finally like moved along, it was like, all right, you know, here's, here's the tune. Like I said, I was, I was just really impressed with um, what you had come up with. And, you know, similar to you, it's kind of, I was kind of happy that I couldn't find the old version to compare it to. Uh, it's just kind of like, oh, it's, it's far enough in the past that I like what it is now. So yeah, I know for me, like uh, I can be uh, sometimes a little too uh, precious with like a uh, song or lyrics, especially, you know, where it's just like, mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to hurt it. I, I, I got it to this this place and that's good enough. And I think you you might know and, and I certainly try and come around the fact that, you know, that's part of the process is to like tear it down, build it up, tear it down, you know, re mm -hmm. rewrite and rewrite. So, um, which is hard, especially for me, because like I said, you know, I'll get to that place where I've, I've clawed my way to getting it to a certain level and I don't want to hurt it. You know, it's, it's like, uh, it's, precious is what comes to mind for me yeah no absolutely um, but yeah 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 it's oh i i know i mean like there's i had so many like when i did go back to the original lyrics as i was playing it before i rewrote it i said well what was it so i found the original lyrics and i started playing it and i'm like okay the, the way i approached it was what part of this do i not want to lose yeah. and what part of it can can sort of just evolve right and like come into a better place and i always had felt that um even though I really like the original verse melody, I, I felt like it kind of boxed us in a corner a lot of the times in terms of like how how we could write what was going on. And then of course, how we were using the, for those of you who've listened to the song, the we go from the F sharp to the A to the E, right? And there's like a climb there yeah. and it's sort of, and it's basically what the chorus is, but mm -hmm. um, it just never felt like a chorus chorus. And so it was like, and I think that's why it was so hazy for you. Like yeah. I, there are certain songs of ours that aren't hazy. Now, some of them, you know, we spend a lot more time on, so that's not fair, but like, there's just songs they were written in such a way that, you know, they were memorable. And so like, they're not as hazy. And I think that what leaving things always was left to desire is the lyrical content was not memorable enough to lock in there. Sure. I think, I think the only thing uh, that ever seemed that I could remember consistently, which is what I kept in this new version is that sometimes you got to leave something sometimes, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and cause that was the most chorus sort of like thing that was in it anyway, it was catchy and it, and it repeated. It's a hook. Yeah. It's a, yeah. So I kept that, but you know, I, I decided, okay, well let's take the music and let's just, if, if this is about, you know, sometimes you just got to pack up your gear and get on the road and get out of whatever mess you're in you know, or, or, or go find that thing you're trying to find. I think it's all sort of relative. What would that, how would I speak to that? You know, there's other songs that deal with the sim similar idea, but they come from a different emotional place. So like, what's cool about Leaving Things is Leaving Things is the young version. If I, if I was to break down like how this record's written, Leaving Things is the spirit of the young person doing that. And later on in the record, there's a song called Open Road, actually. And that song is the spirit of someone who's found some kind of maturity and wisdom. So you have bookends there, which is fun too. And and so when I when I worked on the lyrics, and it's really just about, yeah, you know, just getting out there and um, working hard and trying to find yourself. And and um, sometimes you just got to leave. Like the idea of leaving it all on the highway is really just sometimes you got to, you know, the old sports term was leave it all on the mat, right? It's like sometimes you just got to go out and just do it and wear you know wear yourself down to get to what you're trying to find. And I think that's what the song has become. And it feels really good. I mean, I. I, I know you had mentioned too that you liked uh, in particular the highway part of it and sort of how that chorus came together. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's wild to hear you talk about it, you know, cause like uh, when the song was written, you and I were like at the start of the road or the journey, you know, really <laughs> yeah. kind of like, I know for me, it was, you know, really pining uh, to get into the thick of it, you know, and, and uh, it's interesting to think about like uh 
you didn't really write the the new lyrics until you actually lived, you know, you know, putting it all in the rear view and, and taking a mm -hmm. chance. Um, <laughs> that's wild to think about. Uh, yeah. yeah, no. And I think I hope that maybe what I did well is I was able to recapture the feeling of what I felt like then through the lyrics. But of course, I'm not that person right now. I'm a different person. Yeah. But yeah, like uh, to be young, to be free, to be out there on your own with the world on a string clear skies no rain um uh with your eye on the prize pedal down in your own lane like i mean this is like so being young and it's like yeah. i'm going and that's what it's supposed to, that's the feel of it um but you know we, i kept the other line i kept in there which was in the old old song is don't take more than you need mm -hmm. i always remembered that line too and i felt like that's kind of an important statement anyway um and then some new lines that are in the chorus let your soul feel the speed and when you're uh sometimes when the road is long you just got to leave it out on the highway and so it's like I, I it really just sort of speaks to that that spirit and that was uh you know that was the hope in regards to the actual recording now so now we've gotten to the place where it was written and i i sent that to you and again you were you were excited about it and then i brought to you which i i think we i had been wanting to do this for a very long time and i didn't have anything that was really going to be a place where we could do it but i wanted to get you playing guitar on something of mine again because it's been years since we've done that um and so it was really exciting that i was able to bring this to you and then you know ask if you would be willing to to do some guitar work we do have sean Byrne who plays guitar on it as well so then this song is one of it's the only song on the record that kind of has that dueling guitar Almond brothers vibe you know like <laughs> there's two different like leads sort of going uh which is fun i, I think it's cool that that's on a, one of the songs in the record and i'm glad it's this one but you know tell me a little bit about like your thoughts about putting guitar on it for the first time in a while and then maybe the process that you went through to get what we got <clears throat> yeah uh well i i'm i'm still uh really excited to meet sean because like i i, I heard this tune and i was like oh this is all the stuff that i would play uh, <laughs> what, what, what do you want me to do on this you know uh so uh kudos to sean I, you know i've i've heard nothing but great things and, uh, <laughs> kindred spirit so you know th that was um you know it, uh, truthfully that was a little kind of like uh you know initially kind of disappointing because i was like well he's doing all the things that i i would want to do here so you know part of it for me was um trying to kind of fill in the gaps you know um mm -hmm. so you know there's kind of some some spaces in some of the in the verses or the breakdown you know so i was trying to be uh thoughtful about um you know what what i could add to it you know i think for me um it's hard for me to just kind of start in that special place so mm -hmm. i just started with the basic i just started to play through it you know so i added uh, a similar acoustic um you know just kind of strummed through the progression of the song and then i added uh you know the riff guitar and you know what's a rock song without a doubled riff you know so i i, I doubled that and, you know so then you start to kind of like dive into the song and you feel like you're a part of it you know so um once I got to that point, you know, the, the creative juices are a little bit more flowing in, in that moment. So I, I'm really, I really like this kind of, you know, it's just kind of this little rhythmic thing that uh, I, I feel anyway, adds like a nice little flavor in there. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, just because I'm me, I gotta, I gotta, you know, shred over it or, or noodle on it in some way. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, even even though once again, I was like, I don't, I'm not sure if this really needs it, but I think Ronnie would be disappointed if I didn't just, you know, leave my mark on it, so to speak. So, yeah. you know, I think um, what was really fun in this experience, you know, a lot of things, obviously, but um, it, when you sent me the track, it was kind of like the beginning of the pandemic. So, yeah, you know, I was really at home just uh really missing uh making and playing music so uh it kind of really helped spark me in my own um record making process and it yeah it just really helped me realize that uh even if we can't be playing music together you know we can be working on it and uh so yeah, dude. you know it was a lot of fun there and like i said it kind of uh catapulted me into you know, starting to work on my own demos and then, you know, uh, the record that I've been working on this year. So uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, 
Yeah. In regards to like the approach and like what, how you took, I, I actually think it's overall beneficial that like when you got the tracks, there was a little bit of that, like, well, Sean has already covered some of the ground that I might've gone down because I think it, it did a nice thing. Cause it, it kind of pushed you to, to add some parts that was still very much you, but like, yeah complimented it and went and went a little bit different and i think it does give it more of that sort of dueling uh lead player vibe that i think um really that song out of all the songs on the record really can have because it's i mean like you said i mean that song is just a rocking moving song it you know it, it just drives it's drives i mean there's a lot of songs that drive on the record because of the nature of the theme of the record but that one in particular is just like moving and yeah Guitar work, you know, if you if you listen to how they that Brian sort of produced and mixed the the intro, he really played off of the 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 dueling sound. So he kind of cut it so that the between you and Sean, the parts were going back and forth, which is really fun because you can tell they're two different guitars. Yeah. And you know, I could see that at a live show, you know, and it's like song kicks off and one guitar player is like this and the other one's doing that and, and it's back and forth to kick it off and it would just feel amazing you know it would just be yeah. so much fun and it is a fun song like I, it always was a fun song and to see how it's all come together is just really exciting because it is super fun it's it's uh very enjoyable and it when, when people see this and it's done my hope we'll see if it if it still happens my hope is that the other fun addition that uh will be on it that has not been added as we are recording this right now uh, is the Soul Singers, <laughs> um, which goes back to uh, Andy and I's history of uh, <laughs> recording, because uh, we, years ago, uh, recorded a song called Similar Minds uh, with our band Walkman Light in the early days of Chicago, and we used some awesome Soul Singers um, on that song. Do you remember a uh, little bit about that process? And um, I don't remember the ladies' names. I wish I did. They were they were pretty great. That was that was like uh, Ronnie had died and gone to heaven uh, <laughs> with the uh, the Bumpus Girls. The Bumpus um, Girls, that's what it was. Yeah, <clears throat> I I can't remember their names either. It's been so long, but they were the backup singers for uh, Bumpus, and um, they were so and, good. Uh, yeah, you know, I think that was like uh, for us, you know, that uh, walking into you know what professional musicians are capable of, you know, in the early days where we basically like set up a date they came in they heard the song they worked out a few things between them we cut it we did a few passes and that was it and it was great you know and it's just on the money so yeah dude uh, it's so on the money <laughs> well and, and, and another reason why i feel so strongly to add those soul singers to this song not only because it can be very appropriate uh just to the song but you know it's i it's sort of a little bit of a statement on my end about uh, harking back to the past it's like you know this is it's not only is it something that i've done before in, in bands that i've been in but it's also a song that i wrote with you and that you're playing on so there's a there's a lot that goes all together and i think most of the people who listen to the record won't know any of that they won't have any idea about it but we know about it and it's it's a it's a sort of a piece of the past that lives in this record is what i want it to be um and helps carry things forward which is really cool and we may I mean, if we get them out if we're able to secure them and get them to work on this song there might be one other song i put them on just because we'll have them in the studio there's yeah. one other one that sort of could use them maybe it's kind of a it's got more of a gospel vibe sort of in sort of the tone of it so it's like maybe they would be good for that but that one for sure i think you know i mean just think about it like out on a highway and they're just like <laughs> jazz hands and going crazy yeah that would be amazing it's like sunday morning at church man. You know? <laughs> right yeah it would be good. Uh, yeah and i i think once again that just kind of uh adds to the uh uh what the song is really uh evoking out of the listener you know it's really kind of just that raw motion and, and just uh you know that loose feel and uh you know trying to connect uh, with whatever it is you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the other thing that I was going to ask you about this uh, particular song is maybe talk a little bit about the gear you use. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I could talk gear all day. Uh, <laughs> I figured you could. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, uh, I used a bunch of different guitars. I'm looking at two of them over here. Um, Feel free to show so them I, if you, if you want. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, um, 
you know, I have a pretty, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I have a pretty uh, big arsenal to choose from uh, guitar wise, but I wanted to uh, choose my weapons wisely there. So, you know, it's kind of hard not to play a Telecaster um, on a song like this. So I used uh, both of my Tele's, um, one set up like uh, Keith Richards, it's got a humbucker in the neck and a Tele single coil on the bridge, you know, so use that kind of for that real um that rhythm riff and then um you know when i doubled that i kind of wanted to complement that so i got a a les paul special that has p90 pickups in it um you know it's kind of got that kind of like growl bite to it um so i used those two guitars and then i used my other telly which is kind of more uh traditionally set up with single coils and um you played that you know for that kind of um uh, riff or that that rhythmical fill and then I think I played some of the lead stuff on there as well you know for an amp I used uh two I used a Fender Deluxe and uh, mm. uh a Fender uh Champ that I have and uh you know it was great because like I said uh, I was Jones and that just play at that point so you know I I at the place that we were living at, it was kind of, uh, we were on two floors. So I put my amps upstairs and just, you know, kind of cranking them. Uh, <laughs> that, that was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, effects pedal wise is pretty straightforward, you know, maybe just kind of some overdrive pedals. Yeah. I think I, I have a TS-808 pedal that's, you know, kind of uh, that light overdrive kind of gain, um, just kind of creamy enough. Um, so it, it was, like I said, it was a lot of fun, you know, um, just trying to, uh, experiment and, you know, g get the right vibe. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting the different types of, uh, gear that you use and that, like Sean used too, cause I, I did a video with him the other day and we, and, and you, you should, we'll be able to see it on the website and he talks about some of the, the guitars he used and, um, uh, one was a Gibson Les Paul that um i forget what year it's from it was his dad's like oh, so wow. it's, it's like from 60 something like it's an incredible awesome. gu incredible guitar um and there's oh wait man i wish i wish i could remember the other guitar that he used um and then like we not on this song but the other the other gear that sean used at one point on a different song that's on the record is he had a baritone guitar awesome. that he used which is a, just for a specific riff that works really well and a couple other color spots on the song and um, but yeah, you guys are very similar in sort of your understanding of guitar and music and, and what you like to play and your style. I mean, it, it, I guess it's probably obvious why I, I became so such good friends and, and collaborators with Sean, because it's like, you know, you guys are very similar. So it's like somebody I connect with musically, it's going to be somebody close, similar to Andy. Because <laughs> it's like, that's, that's where my vibe is. That's like what I, what I really like. I mean, there's a lot of people I've worked with here in this town and they have different vibes and, and I like all of them. They're all really cool. But, you know, Sean was the person that we started doing the Sea Changer thing with. And, you know, I knew he was going to be good for a lot of what this record would need too. So it's, it's exciting to have you guys both on there. And it's so cool to see how you guys approach what you use and why you use it and that's that's an area of like in the music stuff I, you know i only know so much about I, I know i know of these guitars i know their sounds and stuff but like to know that this is like maybe the kind of guitar, guitar that you'll need for this kind of song yeah that goes over my head a little bit <laughs> maybe acoustics uh, i might know a little bit better but yeah um, you know you well i wouldn't sell yourself too short man i, I mean I, I think you work more on on feel than uh, uh background so yeah you know uh i'm just you know obsessed with guitars and mm -hmm. i want to play them all you know although i don't have a baritone so i guess i gotta buy one of those now yeah uh, check it out man it is it's a cool <laughs> too the other thing that that sean has which is really fun is uh he he took an acoustic and he, and he they call it a high he makes it a high strung acoustic have Nashville you heard of that? tuning the natural tuning yeah yeah and uh it does some really interesting stuff man you can get some really cool sounds yeah. using that guitar so if you find and he used to some old crappy guitar like well it you know one that somebody might think is crappy that if you just put a little energy into it it's not actually that crappy but yeah but you know it wasn't like some super expensive guitar that he turned into the you know he was just trying to find something he could use to do that and um it's really cool We'll have to have some kind of uh, 
Well, we need to get one of when this stuff all ends or, or if it does end in some way and we're a little bit freer to move around, we got to get you down here, here in Nashville and in the studio with Sean. I think you guys would hit it off really well. And, yeah. You know, and maybe yeah, there's something to that. I, th- I think, you know, um, it sounds like Sean and I uh, share the same kind of uh, passion and excitement for I think that's one of the greatest things about, um, you know, making music in a studio or you know in a studio environment you know where you just have uh all these tools that you get to pick from and uh and they add so much texture and mm-hmm. um, sound and and you know i think us as listeners really take that for granted a lot of times you know the fact that we're listening to the song and it sounds good or bad um you know the the reality is somebody has probably like spent tens of hours you know tens 40, 50, 60 hours, 100 hours on this song, you know, kind of crafting it. They'll sound a certain trying. way. And yeah, in their minds, it sounded great. Like, like, and it probably does if, you, if you're coming from where they're coming from on it, right? It's because sound is objective. I mean, there's some things that don't sound that great, but um, there's other things that some people don't think sound good. But if you think of it where it's coming from and what it's trying to do, it actually does sound pretty good. You know, it's just going for yeah. a certain sound. Sure. You know, and some people like that sound and they don't. Um, you know, I've been listening to so many records of late because that's my, been my, this new thing that I've been on. And um, it's amazing just how different things are recorded and, and why something sounds the way it does and what the choices people made, you know, yeah, from drums to bass sounds. I mean, bass sounds is, is such a thing. Just being being very intentional about getting the right bass sound because the wrong bass sound could ruin the whole song. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah <laughs> it's like okay you know the part's great this bass sounds terrible or it's not the right tone for the song and so now it sounds weird and finding that like that's the stuff you producers like you and sean and brian and people that are you have the like the producer mind but then also the, like the understanding of gear with that which is so important that's where you, that's where people can shine because it's like well yeah that's a great that's a great bass part that's awesome but like a straight like whatever I don't know, jazz man bass with like just a simple app might not be enough for it. It might need this other thing. Yeah. And uh, I think that's cool. That's been fun to watch. Um, you know, uh, it was fun to watch. Look, some of these songs, Brian uh, ended up doing a, a lot of the stuff himself because they were songs we didn't do at Blackbird. And uh, sitting in a room with him while we were like, basically he was working on a bass part and I would just tell him what I liked and what I, you know, thought maybe yeah keep that or maybe not that and just watching him put all that together and bass is not his main instrument i mean he, he's just a guitar player right so i guess i shouldn't say that it's like when you're a, just a guitar player you can play anything but i don't know him i knew brian as a guitar like a like you like an, an axe man right and to watch him play bass and i'm like oh my gosh you're a bass player <laughs> 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 like he was so good at it you know and, and i'm sure you could do that too it's like you know maybe not like victor wooten slap stuff but like you know to be able to play parts um, that just feel so right and have that feel and, and, and also feel like it's, you know, what we tried to do is we, in a lot of these different parts is like, if it doesn't have to be just a straight part, if it can have character, right. Let's do that. Kind of thinking like if we were a band, the bass player is not going to just play straight parts. The bass player wants some character too. Right. Yeah. If the, if you're in a full band and everybody's a piece of the puzzle. So how would we write a bass for that compared to like a session guy coming in and just, playing a straight bass line just to solely work for the drums, you know? Yeah. So we're trying to have that balance. <clears throat> and well, I'm still, uh, I'm still kicking myself for uh, not being able to make it down for the sessions at Blackbird. You know? Yeah, so. dude. Oh my gosh. Oh, oh man. If you would have been there on the day we tracked this song and, oh, it, it was amazing. And, and we could talk a little bit about that. This is some extra footage for this video. Um, so in Blackbird, Blackbird Studios in Nashville, Tennessee, that's where we lay down six of the 12 tracks, 11 tracks that are on the record. And uh, we did that li- basically live and sort you know, sort of more like the traditional way you record a record. So we were all in our separate uh, different rooms. The, the drummer, the bass player, and Sean, the guitar player, were all in the same big room. I was in a sound room in the, playing acoustic and singing. And then, of course, we had the engineer and the producer in the other room, in the, in the main room. And we were in Studio A, which anybody who knows Blackbird, that's the studio we were in, Studio A. It's the main studio. 
it's the studio that the Neve console that runs the whole thing was uh, uh, what's his name? Fagan from uh, Celia Dan. Fagan. Yeah, it was his console that they used to record Asia with. So yeah. that was that was wild. <laughs> And there's all these, you know, they have all this gear in there and a lot of the gear is from Abbey Road. So like um, there's one particular um, preamp or whatever it's called that was definitely used in that. So that like a lot like uh, Here Comes the Sun and a bunch of other songs were that ran through it. Right. Yeah. Which is incredible. So all this stuff is in this place and it's just a magical <clears throat> space. And yeah, we just ran through the songs. And I remember when we did this song in particular, Leaving Things. Um here, this I did want to talk about this, so this is the perfect chance to talk about this. So the old ending to our song had a certain thing that we did, and it and it was uh it was a harken back, like we basically ended the song with the bridge part, and then we like did like an extra part to it, and then and then you know we resolve on the E, right? And I wanted to keep that, like I wanted yeah. to keep it because I always thought that was such a cool thing that the two of us had written to add into the song. And everyone's like, yeah, this is a great part, but it's a little too long for the ending. They're like, and, and they're thinking from a song perspective. Like I'm thinking, yeah. a lot of times I think we also wrote things we were thinking from playing live. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh yeah, this is so fun to do live, right? But if you're thinking about a concise song, maybe this was a little too much. What was really cool is in that session when we're all in there and we're playing through the song, we get to that part, ideas were going back and forth and we realized we could have a hybrid, which would really work which is what's on the record. And it sort of teases what we did at the front end of what we did. And then it, and it also kind of keeps the back of it. And we just kind of cut like a little slice out of the middle. So it's not so, so long. And that was really fun. And I don't know if we would have thought of that if we weren't all there, like in that playing it like a band. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I love that idea of like, um, I haven't thought about it in that way for a long time, but yeah, it's really kind of this, uh, reprise or tag you know at the end of the song that kind of just gives it that um, little extra excitement and in a live setting you know it's something that you could really kind of stretch out and really build up and you know like you said there's there's just so much energy that's available and in, in something like that but doesn't always translate that well to the recorded version you know so i i really love what you guys kind of condensed it down to and i think it it still captures like the you know the oomph of that part yeah it, it the spirit's there you get it you know the part but it doesn't overdo it to where it may feel like you're just now you're kind of dragging on a little bit whereas in a like again like you said in a live setting you would never think they're dragging on you kind of don't want them to stop yeah so it's like you want them to drag that on and, and we come from with, with our age and where we grew up and in the music we were what was around us when we were young you know being surrounded by a lot of jam bands and things of that nature like that idea is never even a, a problem to us it's like oh yeah you just keep playing like <laughs> <laughs> that's a cool part let's play it 17 times so, yeah you know what i mean like that all makes sense but yeah in the recording process is obviously a lot different <clears throat> and and recording now is, you know, well, you know, sort of people's sensibilities about songs are different nowadays, too, a little bit. And, you know, finding happy mediums, I think, was really important. And and this whole process of making the record has been amazing to go through that, which, you know, I definitely wish I could share with that, share more about that with you, because it's like, and we will at some point, but just, you know, taking a song and then saying, well, you know, let's, let's just do this a little bit. Um, let's maybe change this just a tad. Um you know, there's a song on the record called I-40, which is a, a signature piece on the record. And I've always played it a certain way. And basically, I still play it the same way on the record. But there's two spots where Brian was like, you need to make it longer. Like, once you hang on this chord and let's stretch this out a couple bars and let's do that again over here. Give room for give some space for some guitar work. And I think in his case, he used pedal steel. But, you know, because otherwise the song's just a little too short, like it's too much of like a quick ditty. <laughs> and and it gave it room and when you listen to the recording you're like oh yeah i like the way this feels as a recording i don't necessarily play it that way even now even though i've done the new version right like when i play it live i kind of still play the other version just because i might do it the, the, if i had other musicians with me like you know i had a guitar player with me or if it was a full band i would do that version but like by myself acoustic it's not necessary yeah. right but it works really great on a record and those are just really cool realizations. The other thing I'll ask you before we, we do our final thoughts, because now you said you're working on your record. 
And I definitely want you to talk a little bit about that. But, you know, the other thing that I found is we I would get these mixes of these songs, right? They would be sent to me and I would listen to them in the car and I would try to just make sure things are what I want them to be, right? So I'd listen to them over and over again. And it was really interesting to see how I thought some lyrics were done. And then as I would sing them and listen to them, I would be like, no, that needs to be different. That needs to be a little different. And I would just whittle away. This is when I had the scratch vocals, right? So I still had time to do the final vocal. So I'd like, yeah. oh, no, let's fix that. Let's change that. There's a lot of writing that still happened even after the songs before I finally got to do the final vocal that I was still whittling at. I've never had that experience to have that much time, but also to, to be that intentional to where I just hammered away at something. Do you experience that sometimes with like when you're writing these things that you're doing for your record? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I like we were talking about before, I think that's just um, what I've come to realize as, as one of the crucial parts of the process. You know, um, like uh, when I'm working on a new song, like writing it, you know, I'll do the same process where I'll, I'll record it on my phone, you know, a version of it, and then I'll listen to it over and over. I like this. I need to change that. This needs to happen. You know, so I think when um, you're working on something in the studio, it's, just, it's the same thing, you know. Um, for me, I, I tend to be more uh, uh, musically revised, you know, where it's like, oh, is this part right for this section? But um, absolutely, you know, lyrics are the same way where it's like, <clears throat> I'll hum a melody or kind of mumble through some words just to kind of get it there, knowing that something more substantial needs to be in that place. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely that's that's the process I've lived with for a long time. And I, it's funny how, you know, you had this experience with me in our early days in particular, but like when you have the ability to sort of th think melody wise and sort of sing around here they call it scrambled eggs like you just scream sort of random stuff that like gives you your melody points like your where things should yeah. go well if you're kind of good at doing that to start writing songs it's it sure comes in handy when you forget your lyrics while you're playing yeah <laughs> but it's it's yeah it's it's you know it's the early draft of like getting your ideas out without losing them and then you you're able to whittle at them and just work them and really find what's supposed to go there because a, a song a great song isn't great without the that full marriage of the right lyric and the right melody and the right rhythm and, and the right sounds you know and you know if if one of those are off it's just sort of you can tell you kind of can tell and yeah yeah i think uh it's it's funny you brought that up because like uh you know when i uh started this band and started performing live you know it's not until you're like in that moment of playing the song in front of people where you're just like your mind just goes completely blank and you know you have to sing something and so just let it fall out of your mouth you know the chances of uh, the reality <laughs> is is nobody but you and probably me if if you're in ronnie's case is is going to know that you sang the wrong thing you know so uh yeah, it's you, just, you have a new found appreciation for my oh, circumstances. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was just like, oh, that I this makes sense now, you know. Uh, and uh, I, I think, uh, I think that's like one of my like fondest memories of us playing together all those years ago. Now, you know, it's just kind of like that ability to kind of. I, I love the term scrambled eggs. You know, that, that's great. Uh, yeah, and I, I think every singer. Uh, especially every singer, you know, musician uh, has experienced that in probably any show that they've ever played, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, you either do that. The other one you do, which is unfortunate, is you start in the wrong spot. So, like, there's a, I have a great video, a DVD of, of Bruce Springsteen playing this song, one of his most famous songs on piano in Barcelona. I don't know which one it is. It might be like darkness on the edge of town or something like a huge one. Right. And he's playing it and he starts the second verse, maybe with the third verse instead of the second or something. He starts in the wrong spot and he gets like two cent, a, a sentence and a half in. And he's like, no, nope, that's not it. <laughs> and everybody's like, <laughs> oh. you know, but when you're, you, when you're somebody like that, they actually love that. Cause they're like, oh, you're human. But also that was cool. Cause no one else gets to see that. Right. When no yeah. one knows who you are, they just think you're either that was a crappy lyric or you, they just it's obvious you messed up and they think you're bad. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's like annoying. It's like, dude, I'm human. This is this is this is what it is. Do you know how many songs I have to remember for the show? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah, those were the days, man. Those were fun days. I always I think on those often and like just those all the crazy rooms we played. <laughs> The basement what of, was that uh, place uh in on the south side um and mm-hmm. we used to play those uh those gigs on uh, eric I don't, yeah. I don't remember what the bar was though it was like in bridgeport or something oh shoot what was that place <laughs> i don't know it's, all i remember is like nobody would cheer or clap it was just like playing to, you know, a crowded bar. And then at the very end of the show, people would come up and be like, you guys are awesome. I was like, man, why didn't you say so? <laughs> yeah, that was weird. That was so weird. I, I think the weirdest place we ever played, well, the most aw- strange place was the back, the back room of the restaurant I worked at, Kachina Bella. That was weird. And then... uh it was weird because it was just like you could hear a pin drop in that place. Yeah. Well, and it was just so sort of odd pairing, you know. Yeah. We're playing like bar band college rock music in, in this Italian restaurant in the middle of the old town Chicago. That was strange. One of my favorite shows we ever played, uh, fun wise, which I thought felt like I, it really it was the most like band feeling show. And you might tell me otherwise, but that I can remember is when we played, was it subterranean? Yeah. With the people on the top. And like, I, I was like, Whoa, I could pick, I mean, it was pretty busy too. Like I felt like yeah. we had a good crowd, but I could also imagine if that place was packed, what that would be like, cause they're just hanging out watching like over and so you got people up here. I mean, what a cool venue that was. I think the greatest, uh, what, why that stands out aside from that is that was the gig where, uh, Tim, was using my huge bass amp and we put it in the back and it wasn't fully all the way in and Tim slammed the door and just completely shattered my back window. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the dead of winter. And oh was, you, were... you know it was like midnight. We had to like park my car in the back of the apartment building because it just <laughs> had no window in it. <laughs> I'm glad that was after the show because yeah, <laughs> you would not have played well that show. I don't think. <laughs> no, I mean it was hilarious at the time because there was just like it just literally just exploded into a million pieces, and <laughs> and Tim was just, I, he was just so excited, you know, from a fun show that we had played. Yeah, uh, dude, it was so, so fun. Yeah, I think that, was... that and another one that stands out for me is. Uh, playing that frat party at the beta house where the fire alarm got pulled. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. You remember that? Where we had to like pull all our gear out. And then who was our manager at the time? That tall kid. He was like 20. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. He was short lived, I think. Right. He was short lived. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was that my, was that the beta house I was in? Yeah. Yeah. It I'm was like some, a, a year or two after after we graduated oh weird maybe i was so maybe i was pissed about that that they pulled the fire alarm while we were playing that i've totally forgotten about that it's possible (laughs) no i I, I don't have trouble remembering that particular thing um so who was that with was that still with jeremy and who who was playing in that show it had to be jeremy probably it was definitely jeremy but i don't remember who was playing bass though I don't know if it was Paul yet, or I don't think it was Brian. Not, I'm not sure if it was Tim either. So I don't, maybe we had I, yeah, a fill in. Yeah, that's a weird. That that's that one's strange. And then we played a place. Didn't we like supposedly play a show at some bar that technically was on the bill with Gin Blossoms? Weren't they like? Like we were like, like we weren't really on, like we played the early, something early and that later that night in that same place they were playing. I, I thought that was, and it was like, we laughed because it was like, man, they must be hurting. <laughs> it was like, this is like a popular band at one time, but it was like, um, why are they playing this place? <laughs> it's possible. I don't know if I remember that, but. I think we were playing early in the day. Like, so we weren't really on the bill, but like. <laughs> 
it was just yeah. like it, it, there was some kind of memory I have of that for some reason, and I might be blending something together. Uh, I just it's possible. I, yeah, I just do remember thinking like, why is this band playing here? Yeah, because it was kind of like, okay, man, times change. But yeah, those were all those are all great memories, and we 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 should totally do a find you know maybe get some of the other guys involved, give Sadowski a call and Mike and Jeremy and everybody, and try to do some kind of something fun i mean i think it would be fun to try to even if it's just a zoom call and everybody's just talking and chatting about i mean there's got to be stuff that they remember that i don't even remember <laughs> yeah i mean i i think that's what's uh so special about that time you know it's just like we all have our version of it you know we all got through it together you know especially like making that record i mean that was such a, a time stamp for me you know such a pivotal thing yeah, it's such a time stamp. I mean, everything about that whole experience, just the fact that we just on a whim said, hey, we're going to knock on this guy's door and record a record. And then he just opened the door and was like, okay, come on in. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, and, it's, and it's Mark Rubel of all people, you know? I know. He's such a, a legendary guy, you know? like I know, dude. And and then, and then you know, to tie that around to now, that he works at Blackbird now. And then yeah. I, I had, you know, I've talked with him and had lunch with him since and we've talked about our experience with Phineas Gage and his old studio and you know what he's doing now which is really cool teaching students he's a he's an academy yeah. teacher there and Blackbird Academy so it's weird how it all comes together but Andy I really appreciate you taking the time today to us hash outs obviously this it's fun I could talk for hours about the past but um definitely about leaving things and I'm and it means the world to me that you were able to play on the record and it sounds incredible, dude. I'm so excited yeah. about it. I'm so, I can't wait to, to get it out into the world and for people to experience it. And, you know, I'm trying to figure out what, what songs are going to go, what we're going to do with each song. And it really does sound great. Do you have any final thoughts about the song or the process and everything? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I can't thank you enough, you know, to, to be a part of this you know i know uh how sp uh, special it is for you um just as making this whole record and, and what you're working on so to be uh even just considered to be a part of it is really special to me you know it's just um um you know i think uh i mean how long have you lived in nashville now you know we've we, we haven't we haven't had a chance to really play we've played together a handful of times over the last you know yeah. 15 years you know so um i think that's one of the things that uh is always hard for me to accept you know that mm -hmm. that that i can't just call you up and we can jam so these things are always really special um and uh you know i i think it's a testament to friendship and uh the craft of songwriting just working on music i i mean i i think a lot more these days you know with technology and people living all over the world you know that is one of the great things uh that we can do now is uh, you can write a song and you could send it to me and i can play on it uh, from home you know um so it's certainly something that i want to you know continue to pursue and and uh sure. enjoy ultimately yeah. and we shall man we'll figure it out that uh we'll make the uh maybe we can make the 20s the 2020s uh more collaborative and more interactive and not just music but in friendship and all those things so you, yeah. you know we definitely can do these kind of things with these and i think we i definitely want to get some of our our uh zoom chats with our close friends from around the area going again um and then Absolutely. you know when, when things open up we'll take a trip i, I know i'm going to try for sure to take a trip down to chicago this summer to play some shows so i'll be talking to you about that and then um yeah. You know, maybe we just work out a whole thing. Maybe I can take a an extended period of time in the city and we can do some recording, playing, you know, have fun with it. So yeah. we will be talking about that. Everybody, thank you for listening. Um, it's my pleasure again to have Andy Madden, Toy Robots, and uh, just keep watching. We got a lot of these videos coming. Uh, we're going to talk more about each of the song on the record. So hope you enjoyed listening to Leaving Things in our conversation, and we will talk to you next time. All right. To be young, how to be free To be out there on your own chasing down a dream